Hi class. So I forgot to hit the record button the first time I recorded this. So uh, here's my re-recording of the first part of lecture. Um, I'll be doing some background on Nietzsche and some key concepts, uh, a bit of history about the man and his life uh, and his general philosophical project. And then I'll just transition straight into um, the discussion that we had in class about the passages that we read for this week from Zarathustra and the gay science. Okay, so let's get to it. Um, some housekeeping and administration. Uh, next week, your midterm will open up. So uh, if you have not been attending the live lecture recordings, uh, or if you haven't been participating in the discussion boards or uh, performing write-ups or pitched a creative project to me yet, I strongly recommend taking the midterm. It's optional, you don't have to, um, but it would be a good thing to do to, to catch up on earning some points. And next week, uh, lecture will be a little bit different. We'll be doing a movie night. I'll bring my uh, Blu-ray player into class and we'll watch The Seventh Seal at 6.45, uh, about 15 minutes after the movie ends. I'll start up the Zoom call and we'll have a about an hour long discussion about the movie. Um, so that's that's next week. If you'd like to attend, you're welcome to come in person and I'll bring popcorn and uh, some candy and snacks for everybody. Um, okay, so last week we looked at a Christian response to the problem of being from Kierkegaard, right? To take the uh, absurd to... Uh, perform the movement, movements and the dance of faith uh, to appropriate that absurd to resolve the contradictions uh, that come from uh, existence as a human in a world that is ruled by an all-powerful uh, God. Uh, this week, we'll take one step backwards towards our French existentialists, Sartre de Beauvoir and Camus, who we'll end the class with. Uh, and a, a, a closer to an atheistic perspective of the problem of being, which is sort of like the, the underlying inspiration for existentialism and the issues that we've been talking about in class so far. Um, so Nietzsche is not strictly speaking an existentialist. The, the only existentialists uh, who called themselves such were de Beauvoir and Sartre. Camus didn't even accept the name existentialist, but we put him in that group because they were all, you know, buddy, buddy. Um, Nietzsche is not an existentialist, nor is Nietzsche really concerned with um, the absurd, as we've discussed it through Dostoevsky and through Kierkegaard, um, nor does he uh, sort of explicitly address the problem of being, although it shows up um, in its own forms uh, throughout his work. Um, but Nietzsche is perhaps the biggest inspiration to existentialism proper of any um, pre-existentialism proper thinker. Um, Camus, Sartre de Beauvoir, all of these people are reading and thinking about uh, Nietzsche. And Nietzsche is a big inspiration because Nietzsche's tackling of nihilism as the problem to contend with philosophically, existentially, as a human being was um, uh, is runs in parallel as part and parcel of the problems of the absurd and of being and the contradictions of uh, being the sort of thing, a human that requires meaning, but a world that can't offer it to you. So you can have the absurd, right? Um, that the problem of nihilism, nihilism is an effect of being that, that sort of thing, the human in an absurd condition. Um, and there's all sorts of terrible dogmatic responses to absurdism um, that flow from a nihilistic perspective or a nihilistic uh, motivation um, that Nietzsche wanted to heal. He wanted to get rid of this nihilism in the world just as our existentialists want to as well avoid nihilism and give us answers to um, the problem. So where Kierkegaard considers um, what to do about the absurd. Nietzsche is concerned with a pervasive and problematic response to absurdity, which is nihilism, as I just described. So if there is no God through whom faith can resolve the issue for us, a la Kierkegaard and the, the movements of faith, then new creative solutions are needed. So who was Nietzsche? Born in 1844, died 
1900. He was a full professor at age 24 uh, at Basel in the classics department. So he's a, a philologist. He studied um, the, the uh, linguistics and uh, study of pre-Socratics largely. Um, and to be a full professor at age 24 is something amazing, right? Especially back then in like the 1860s, right? To be a full professor uh, would take typically decades upon decades. Um, and at 24, Nietzsche is publishing powerful enough work and enough work, he was prolific, um, to uh, become full professor and chair of his department. Now, Nietzsche always wanted to be a philosopher, um, but his work in classics and philology was how he got his start. And he was never able to break through into the philosophy department. And this is something that um, sort of plagued him and disturbed him, at least for the period of time in his early life when he was involved with the academy. Um, his first book, The Birth of Tragedy, uh, invited heavy criticism because it was a very peculiar book. Um, it was meant to be a book uh, responding to the classics, uh, but it was written as a work of philosophy, uh, and it was all super Nietzschean and uh, the world was not ready for it. And so the classics people said, hey, this is a weird philosophy thing. I don't understand it. And the philosophers like, this is a weird classics thing. And even then it's stranger because of like what it's saying. I don't understand it. And so nobody liked it. And uh, uh, Nietzsche was really down and out. It's, it's an excellent book. It's just people weren't ready for it yet. Um, so as Nietzsche begins to transition away from academia, um, as he loses uh, the, the rose-colored glasses that allowed him to love academia, he becomes friends with Wagner. And uh, uh, all of Wagner's artistic friends uh, and finds in Wagner something of a uh, mentor. And it's through uh, Wagner's influence, who at the time is writing uh, The Ring Cycle and uh, establishing Bayreuth, the town that to this day still performs the ring cycle every year, that, uh, that, that Nietzsche begins to find uh, a streak of artistic power in himself that combined with his already incredible intellect um, begins to transform itself into the mind of the Nietzsche that we know and love and read today. Uh, now Nietzsche was also perpetually sick uh, and he got sicker with age. Um, uh, he had all sorts of terrible stomach pains and problems uh, and awful headaches and he couldn't sleep naturally. And so he was taking all sorts of strange barbiturates to fall asleep and then uh, stimulants to keep him awake and was, um, uh, he suffered quite a bit uh, and fought through his physical ailments and pain in order to write. Uh, his writing was the only thing that healed him, that made it possible for him to contend with the suffering um, and to make the suffering all worth it. And we see that therapeutic power in, in much of his writing, especially in the gay science. Um, he was prolific, poet, philosopher, artist. He wrote quite a lot and about everything. Um, and the way the story goes, which may be apocryphal, uh, at the end of his life, at the end of his lucid life, uh, Nietzsche was having all sorts of delusions um, and runs out into the street and sees uh, a man whipping a horse uh, and he cries for the horse, breaks down in tears um, and never speaks again, becomes completely catatonic. Now, some people thought that Nietzsche had syphilis, which is not true probably given our, our best evidence, um, what the, the best evidence shows us now is what, what was likely the cause of Nietzsche's catatonia was a uh, brain tumor or something of the sort, some kind of uh, hematoma or hemorrhage uh, in his brain that sort of just slowly expanded and grew to the point where um, he, his mind stopped working normally and then stopped working at all. Um, and he had a nefarious sister, a proto-Nazi sister. And the reason that Nietzsche often gets a bad rap, um, a 
proto-Nazi rap is because of his sister. Nietzsche was not an anti-Semite, not even close to it. He, in fact, despised the political movement that his sister was a part of, uh, which eventually becomes the, the pro-Reich um, German proto-Nazi power, uh, the, the fascist uh, movement in Germany. Um, he despised them, uh, but his works were uh, in notebooks, and his sister, uh, as soon as he goes catatonic, comes into control of these notebooks and rearranges them, moves them around, editorializing them so that they appear to uh, protect and justify this proto-Nazi fascist power. Um, and, and there's there is like a silver lining to this. It's, it's a terrible thing, it's an evil thing, but it's also the reason that we have Nietzsche today, right? The, the reason that we have Nietzsche today is that Nietzsche's sister was a, a master propagandist. She knew how to capture people's attention and how to um, excite them with intrigue and with the power of her brother's intellect. And so although she editorialized and uh, initially gave Nietzsche a terrible rap, which, you know, like uh, if you're, we, we talked about, uh, do we talk about this? No. In my intro class, uh, I discussed Leopold, Leopold and Loeb. If you're familiar with this very famous American court case, they were inspired by uh, the proto-Nazi reading of Nietzsche from his nefarious sister, um, because it, it made Nietzsche infamous. Uh, it was not what Nietzsche thought. And in fact, it took almost a hundred years, uh, uh, five, six, seven decades before Nietzsche is reinterpreted and reorganized in the way that, you know, like he originally put down his works. And we see a very different Nietzsche, one that um, should not be interpreted as a nihilist and as a fascist and as some kind of pronoun. It's just not who he was. But it's because he was interpreted that way and editorialized in that way in the first place that he's famous. Um, so first pass at Nietzsche and his perspective as a Nietzsche. Every one of Nietzsche's books is a book about pretty much everything, um, which makes it a real challenge to teach Nietzsche in a single day. And I thought a, a, a lot about the best way to approach this class to teach Nietzsche in a single day. And what I originally came up with was uh, to give you my perspective um, and then let that be the, the object of educational texture through which you can develop your own perspectives. But then I thought better of it and decided instead that um, the best way to teach Nietzsche would be by getting as many perspectives from the class uh, as I could um, to hear your perspectives and to um, see what and how you all as students engaged with Nietzsche. So the idea of perspectivism is this, there's no um, capital T truth. Nietzsche didn't think that there was such a thing as capital T truth. Everything is in flux and everything is in change, that old Heraclitian principle. You can never step in the same river twice, or as Heraclitus' uh, uh, student Cratylus is quoted saying in Aristotle, you can't even step in the same river once, right? Th this is the principle of uh, motion and nature that Nietzsche believed to be true, that the world is chaos and fundamentally change and it's never the same thing. And so to seek truth is to seek an illusion and a lie. But this doesn't mean that uh, we can't know anything or we, we can't be operative at all with um, like firm epistemic grip in the world. No, of course not. What it means is that there are perspectives on truth, perspectives on fact, perspectives on the way that the world works. And everybody has their own perspective, but this also doesn't mean, it doesn't commit Nietzsche and certainly didn't uh, think so, that um, everybody's perspective is just as good as everybody else's. This is not true. There are better and worse perspectives. And what makes a perspective better according to Nietzsche is its capacity to encompass the natural, um, moral and existential world and make it redeemable, affirmable, to say yes to it, right? To will it over and over again in what he called the eternal recurrence. 
So imagine, and we'll, we'll discuss this later in the lecture, imagine that this world will occur over and over again, right? That everything that has led up to this point in the infinity of the past and everything that will follow in the infinity of the future loops back on itself and reoccurs, right? How would we need to see and interpret and understand that continuum of existence in order to say, yes, it is worth it. It is justified. Yes to life. Let it all happen again. What kind of interpretation or perspective would we need to, to have on that, that uh, kind of life and kind of existence, that kind of cosmos in order to say yes to it? And the best perspectives are the ones that are able to say yes to the whole, and the worst perspectives are the ones that uh, deny themselves the power to say yes. Um, the ones that are, that is nihilistic. Um, okay, so what follows is a discussion of uh, some of the core concepts of Nietzsche that I had with the class, um, beginning with the death of God and the problem of nihilism uh, represented here in The Madman, which we read for class, where Nietzsche says, the madman jumped into their midst and pierced them with his eyes. The madman goes to town in the morning and uh, comes down from the mountain and speaks to the townspeople. He asks, whither is God? I will tell you, we have killed him, you and I. All of us are his murderers. But how could we do this? How could we drink up the sea? Who gave us a sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? What were we doing when we unchained this earth from its sun? Whither are we moving? Away from all suns? Are we not plunging continually backward, sideward, forward in all directions? Is there still any up or down? Are we not straying as through an infinite nothing? Do we not feel the breath of empty space? Has it not become colder? Is not night continually closing in on us? Do we not need to light lanterns in the morning? Do we hear nothing as yet of the noise of the grave diggers who are burying God? Do we smell nothing as yet of the divine decomposition? Gods too decompose. God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. And the people were silent and stared at the madman, to which the madman replies, I have come too early. Okay, so what uh, is going to happen now is I'm going to cut this and go to the class discussion, which will follow through with the rest of lecture. Uh, I hope that you enjoy it. Now, just to be clear, the question that I ask is, what do you take of this quote? Why is Nietzsche saying God is dead and we killed him? What's he talking about? What's Nietzsche on about in this quote? And so what follows is our, our class discussion. like see the nothingness. I don't know how else to describe it. Like he seems like it's he's almost annoyed at our ability to think, like think about the world. Like that seems like it seems like he's talking about God, not only God, just like our the the human condition. Like he's annoyed at our human condition. Yeah. That's how I took it. But the what makes this person mad? Like a crazy mad, right? What makes them crazy? Is their uh being put in contrast with the normal people, right? Your average person, right? Um, it's it's not from the madman's perspective that the person that they're they're a mad person. It's from everybody else's. It's from the villagers, right? The, who is this crazy person who's talking about sponges and horizons and drinking seawater? They probably drank too much seawater themselves, right? Um, and and yeah, that that this idea. Of course, the madman's come too early. Right? It's. He's got the truth of it, at least so Nietzsche thinks. Um, but he's come too early because he's seen as the madman, right? Mikey. Um, this kind of like, at least for me, connected back to some of what he talks about really briefly in Untimely Meditations. Um, like I, where he talks about um, like, orthodoxy and like our fathers and like old generations ideas just like sticking around to our disadvantage um, and basically like harming us from like our true selves and then at one point even talks about how 
a religion that has barely been around um, is like hindering us in our exploration. Um, and I kind of interpreted what he said in untimely meditations is kind of like attached to this in the way that like religion and like spiritual exploration and like seeking for a higher self is great um, until it gets to this point where it's just repeating idea after idea after idea. And like the concept of God um, can be beneficial until we have in essence killed God to our own uh, like orthodox benefit, I guess you could say. Um, and I know he never like explicitly is like organized religion might not be great, at least not like in what we read for the assignments. Um, but it really, it really did a juxtaposition of uh, like the concept of spirituality and God and how he sees that and even talks about like demigods um, versus like how the people follow God, if that makes sense. Yeah, good. So the institution um, which God becomes through the church or through dogmatism and belief uh, is perhaps what allowed God to die, right? Like we're the ones who killed God. So um, yeah, Nietzsche is no fan of Christianity um, or any sort of organized religious institution, uh, but he did respect Jesus. Jesus was someone who um, interpreted the entire world, all of history eternally in a way that was life affirmable. Uh, and it's everybody who follows Jesus that is no good, which would be, you know, Peter and Paul and the disciples and the institution of the church, which uh, then sort of crystallizes God as um, being this and that. And uh, we commune with God doing such and such activities, right? Um, and it's because we uh, like with the capital T truth thing, apply similar sorts of um, epistemic power to these ideas of God in being able to satisfy spiritual needs, um, that uh, God becomes something other than like the horizon, right? It becomes something other than the sea which we've drank up and we find all of a sudden when we're left with a, a church of a hundred thousand strong that help the the many like sands in the sea from suffering even um that where did god go and the original purpose god was supposed to serve which is to make life worth it valuable give us a reason and a purpose for for being here good shane i was just gonna say on the last line where he said i have come to you early i think before this it said that all the people were kind of a little bit atheist rationalist overly rational people and they were pretty happy with that that's the idea I got about it. And none of this landed on them. Like that it hadn't occurred to them that they were missing anything yet. And they didn't realize they were essentially kind of missing the fruit of this rational theory. I could be conflating him and Dostoevsky because there's kind of a similar sentiment in the Desert Underground. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So th this is this is right. The the people are meant to represent, like the villagers are meant to represent um the nihilistic perspective the one that has lost god either through um uh dogmatic uh and um decadent christianity or through um just like nihilism itself now the i've come too early is like they don't get it but there's another part that they don't get which i don't have quoted here which is what follows exactly and, and the madman follows up after says we killed god how should we comfort ourselves the murderers of all murderers what was holiest and mightiest of all that the world has yet owed, owned has bled to death under our knives. Who will wipe this blood off us? What water is there for us to clean ourselves? What festivals of atonement, what sacred games shall we have to invent? Is not the greatness of this deed too great for us? Must we ourselves not become gods simply to appear worthy of it? There has never been a greater deed. And whoever is born after us for the sake of this deed, he will belong to a higher history than all history hitherto. And so this is an important point to know. Nietzsche is saying, look, the, or the madman is saying, look, we killed God. And now we're left without what makes life valuable, powerful, meaningful, important to us. Um, how could we have done this? But it happened. And has it happened because of nihilism? Well, perhaps. Has it happened because of our slipping away from what originally made life valuable? Perhaps. But 
those who are born after us in the wake of the death of God, who can only hear the scraping of the shovels of the to God's grave diggers, right? These children will have an opportunity to repaint back the horizon, to recreate the ocean, right? To um, bring moon, to pull the moons closer to the earth and, you know, like reinvent that source, which once went by the name of God, that makes the world eternally firm. Okay. I think I'm missing something, if you would help me out. I, shouldn't he say, I've come too late? Like, wouldn't he want to, uh, like, warn the people that were killing God? Like, I, I think I'm missing something there. This is an interesting point. I, I think I'll put a pin in it, because we'll talk about time stuff later. Um, but is the madman coming too late or too early? There's no difference. So, yeah. Okay, I'll take your word on that. All right, uh, Rachel. Um, it kind of seemed to me like, though Nietzsche is talking about how we have killed God and he's also like speaking to that. I feel like he thinks that morality is like inherently tied in with like religiosity or the concept of God and not so much that we can't create new modalities of it. But like, like I think the, analogy of like us digging a grave for him is interesting because it almost seems like what he's saying is like god or that ethic of morality is something that's inextricably intertwined and will continue to like haunt us like how he's talking about the grave digger and this and that like it's not just that god is dead but now we have to like dig him a grave and do all this stuff and like i was thinking about even like we can't separate those like out even if we think we can like even in secular uh societies were like oh we have god-given rights like that is how we it's like foundational to the rest of our ethics and stuff even if we think it's distinct a lot of it is still like a pinnacle of it i guess yeah good and i mean that's the way that the the aphorism or vignette ends um it has been related further that on the same day the madman forced his way into several churches and there struck up his Requiem Eternum Deo, which is, uh, Requiem is like a song for the dead, a funeral song they play. The last composition that Mozart made, he only finished like two thirds of it, three quarters, was the Requiem. You'd recognize it if you heard it, super fancy. Um, to the eternal God. So God is dead, but God is eternal. Right? And let out and called to account, he is said always to have replied nothing but, quote, what, after all, are all these churches now if they are not the tombs and sepulchers of God, right? So, so exactly, God is dead, but this idea of God is eternal. And we have all these churches, these artifacts that represent um, the, the death of God and the, the loss of God, that all of the sort of themes that we've talked about, the structures of um, morality and church and, and um, of belief and truth, which amount to kind of nihilism, to... Um, to say, like, I feel satisfied and comforted in there being a truth and there being a God and there being some system of belief that I can just, like, stop thinking for a while and fall into, right? Um, that these churches, which are sepulchers of, of this eternal God, are constant reminders of uh, the fact of the people being unable to hear uh, the madman, to understand the madman, to um, recreate uh, the, the horizon, to... Um, uh, make themselves uh, strong enough to stand before the loss of what God represented originally, which is value and meaning. Good, okay. So let's see what I see here. Um, yeah, so without an essence, like a man is created in the image of God, um, how can we justify our existence without a truth, without capital T truth, without with only perspectives and those perspectives being um, opaque to others and certainly often to ourselves sometimes as well, um, how can we justify our existence to ourselves? Are we not just straying through an infinite nothing? And assent to this question, are we straying through an infinite nothing? You say, yes, of course, right? there is nothing, right? Without rebellion, without Ivan's returning the ticket respectfully or Camus um, saying like, look, screw you absurd, I'll do me, um, is to admit that we're plunging away from all suns, right? Um, that we are nihilists. And the people aren't equipped to hear the cry. They consider the man mad and remain silent. They can't fathom how to answer his question. What is to be done to overcome the smell of divine decomposition? 
So facing the death of God, it would be easy to become hateful, ironic, cynical, scholarly, etc., to seek some other alternative system, some other alternative truth, something to just like take what was God and put it right back so that we can like uh, assuage our fears and our worries, right? Um, and these practices assume some universal value in pursuit of action, self-righteousness, truth, will to X, where you exercise your will to create something that um, asserts itself in this dominant force, this force powerful enough to make lives valuable. But what's hard to face is the facts. Everything is in motion and we're too smart for our own good. We can forget or creatively look away from the problems that face us and the underlying inconsistencies in who and what we are. So Nietzsche re recommends that we become value creators from within our perspectives to find that interpretation of life under which the whole of life can become valuable. So it's through a single value that the value creator, and for Nietzsche, he thought he did this. Um, the, it's the, the transfiguration of all values was his like value that he created, right? So by transfiguring all values beyond good and evil, so to speak, um, Nietzsche inhabits a perspective through which eternally life forwards and backwards is affirmable according to him. Um, and so he becomes the ubermensch that he recommends we all become, right? Um, but what he's recommending is we become value creators, right? And we become inspired by our educators uh, to do this. Uh, to find some value that makes it all worth it, that makes it all worth it to do again. Everything that's happened, terrible and otherwise, um, is redeemable, justifiable, and um, you have to be excited to live it again. How much of your life or of life in totality in general can be unified under your created values? So um, let's... Let's do this. Why don't we break off into small groups for just like a couple of minutes, like a short one, um, and see if we can like come up with a value that makes all of life worth living over and over again. Not just your life, but like all of life. Like what would you say is a value that if we like love it and live by it would justify everything that's happened? So like last time we broke into small groups, we talked about whether it was worth it to like torture to death a single baby, right? Um, imagine that happened, right? And you torture to death a single baby and that, now it's, it's happened, right? What would be the principle of that kingdom that you were the architect of, right? What would be the value that made that torture and death worth it and worth it to do again over and over and over? Okay, so there's your question. Let's take, uh, I don't know, three, let's say four minutes. Can you come up with a world redeeming value that transfigures all of life as redeemable and justifiable in four minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Did we come up with anything online? There are no values to paint back the horizon. <laughs> They're all nihilists. <laughs> <laughs> we came too early. All right. Uh, how about in person? What do we What do we talk about? What do we discuss? Yeah, well, um, mine was kind of cheesy. Yeah, I like hers too. She said passion, but I, when I think of like one thing I can give all these people, I'd say love, which is kind of cheesy. But um, like as I said in our group, when I think about like the reason that I'm living my life, like why not kill myself? It's like uh, mom would be sad. Like you know, I love my mom. I love my friends. And I feel like that really is what keeps me going. It's like, you know, spending time with people I love. Good. So love. Yeah. Okay. If you, if you want, yeah. we can like tag some off each other. All right. Yeah. <laughs> we kind of came up with like a similar idea of so love, always in the abstract. We were kind of saying there isn't like an inherent like value as in like utility. It's like there's this amount of rules or thing, but rather that what gives life meaning is the pursuit of. <laughs> Like the eternal as like a society so like what gives us meaning is it is almost acting individually or collectively as god so not seeing ourselves like individuals eternal but rather society and others as eternal and seeing our impacts on others if god doesn't exist versus just our our individual like lives
Yeah. Cool. It's, it's it's the action of like being part of not just community but community of like society and like in 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 service of others and in that way doing like being in service of society and the service of the eternal of like everyone on earth we we have we had we said it so eloquently and then i'm trying to put it into words like like effectively what we said is in service of aiding others of making others happy making their lives better making everything a bit better and in that way the society and the world and the way that we understand the universe is perpetuated in in the service of that going for eternity in the service of this grand e eternal that we are striving to and that is like in a way like god being in people we are looking for in in we are looking for the, the seeking the eternal in uh each other and that is in itself god yeah i, I think that's a really cool value and that's, that's clear in any capacity and i think it's something that um that nietzsche might have been excited about too um so if i'm understanding it right uh take for example jesus as being the uh the representation or manifestation of the Godhead in humankind. And it's through his sacrifice, the sacrifice of that Godhead through like the sacrifice of his human body that like sins are forgiven and redemption is possible. And that's the Christian story, right? Um, so what we do is we say, look, we interpret not just Christ as being like a Godhead, but we, we look for the Godhead in everyone and we find, um, this redemptive power, this ability to, to sacrifice just by virtue of dying, of being at all. Um, and everyone has that redemptive power. And, and if we see everyone as having that piece of the Godhead and a piece of redemptive power themselves, uh, then that would be a world worth living in. That's right. really back and forward. Yeah, and that and that comes into the uh, like perspectivism thing of like any any answer aside from something like that is is beaten down by well like what about people who don't you know and like we all have our own perspectives we all have our own meaning of to life we all have something that we strive for and we're all doing that in service of our own ideals and our own dreams and our own values but all together why, what is that for? It's in the service of people, in the service of each other, ourselves, to continue the world. It is our, our individual perspectives are all, are all like beautiful and glorious in service of this eternal. Yeah. Um, so at the end of Schopenhauer's Educator, or at least the section that I had you guys read, um, Nietzsche says this of the, the sort of person who's won the game, achieved the goal. Uh, it is incontestable that we are, all, we are all related and allied to the saint, just as we are related to the philosopher and artist. There are moments, and as it were, bright sparks of, of the fire of love in whose light we cease to understand the word I. There lies something beyond our being, which at these moments moves across into it. And we are thus possessed of a heartfelt longing for bridges between here and there. So, I think this is something similar, right? That the person um, who's able to transfigure the world through the value that you guys have suggested is the one who loses a uh, sense of the like human features and sees the bright sparks and the passion and fire that flows through all of us, just like the same. Good. Uh, yeah, Ashley. We had um, we came up with two different scenarios for different, but one of them was logic. We were like kind of playing with that, but and then um, the other one was meaning. Like, tell me if this is like a different question altogether. But I thought about this for a long time. Like everyone says, like the goal in life is like happiness, and like we all know that it's BS. So like, what is it? And like recently, I've been feeling like it's being like feeling or just catharsis maybe. Um, whether it's a sad emotion or not, like, um, I feel really cathartic 
when I when I when I when I feel good. So um, that's all of your relevant healing types. Yeah. So to to live passionately, right? And through our passion, this sounds like what Lux might have suggested, right? Um, through a passionate sort of life, uh, we connect with the world in the way that isn't mental, but is emotional. And uh, nihilism interpreted as a lack of feeling um, causes us to construct a world that can inspire it. But if the value itself is to feel just for the sake of itself and not one way or another, um, then maybe that kind of passionate life uh, where every feature of the world affords feeling is worth it. It makes it redeemable. Good. Is that what you meant by lazy uh, um, before? Uh, At the beginning? Yeah. Yeah, that we're all a little lazy. Um, it, 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 Schopenhauer's educator starts remarkably similarly to fear and trembling. Like everybody's, we're on a clearance sale or people are lazy. Um, they just say, uh, be yourself and that's enough. But that's right, but it's not quite enough, right? We need to dig in, which is exactly so. Okay, so good. Values to redeem the world. Um, we did it in a little more than four minutes. So um, we should be careful of these values that we have suggested. We should be careful of treating them as uh, truth, as universally valuable, as imposable uh, on everyone else's will, right? To say, your will should be to feel, your will should be to uh, interpret the Godhead and every human, right? Uh, to impose this will on everyone and others um, turns out to be a dangerous activity, right? Um, it turns out to be something that uh, can trip us up and turn us into what Nietzsche calls inverse cripples. People who uh, are not crippled by a uh, broken arm or the lack of an ear, um, but by um, bloating themselves existentially, uh, by focusing in dogmatically on a single object or inquiry of truth, exercise of the world and the will. So does somebody want to read for us this passage? I have it, I have it in the book too. You'd rather read from the book. Anybody brave enough? Yeah, well. I see and have seen what is worse and many things so vile that I do not want to speak of everything. And concerning some things, I do not even like to be silent. For there are human beings who lack everything, except one thing of which they have too much. Human beings who are nothing but a big eye or a big mouth or a big belly or anything at all that is big. Inverse cripples, I call them. And when I came out of my solitude, I did not believe my eyes. An ear, an ear as big as a man. I looked still more closely. And indeed, underneath the ear, there was something pit, pitifully small and wretched and slender. And no doubt of it, the tremendous ear was attached to a small, thin stalk, but this stalk was a human being. And if one used a magnifying glass, one could even recognize a tiny envious face. Also that a bloated little soul was dangling from the stalk. The people, however, told me that this great ear was not only a human being, but a great one, a genius. What do you think? What's the inverse cripple? Yeah, Jason. Someone who's myopic and does one thing and they do it extremely well, but they don't do anything else. Yeah, and the giant ear is Nietzsche's scholar, right? I think. Nietzsche talks about, yeah, he criticizes the scholar in Schopenhauer's educator quite a bit. He, the whole end of the essay, which I don't assign, is like an attack on scholars. Um, the scholar is the giant ear, the person who is listening for the truth in the world so much that they become nothing but a giant ear, and their little body is dangling off the, it's kind of a funny image, right? Um, this sort of person who takes their value to be the value and interprets all of the world as as like leading to it, rather than all of the world sort of uh, flowing from it. Um, and in this manner of speaking, we become an inverse cripple. We mistake ourselves. We mistake the world for uh, what we think is true and right and good. Inverse cripples are just people who have committed themselves to one form of value and believe that the value is the ultimate justification for their being without concern for uh, world redemption. 
Scholars exemplify the will to truth and so become giant hearers. Priests exemplify resentment, self-righteousness, and willful subjugation, and so they become giant mouths. Hedonists might be giant stomachs. The moral of the story is just that values are not good for the sake of themselves, that we don't like interpret the world for the sake of the value. The value is what we use functionally to redeem the world, right? But what the inverse cripple does is they flip-flop that. They make the mistake of thinking that what matters, right, is that I get down to the truth of it, and I just keep digging and digging until I get there. Well, you might find if you keep digging and digging, you know, big giant biceps and the rest of you is frail and weak and your brain's rotted away. Um, so values are only good insofar as they are the byproduct of willing the eternal return, which gives us life affirmation and yes saying to life. So here is another passage. Um, so let me mark it here. Does somebody want to read this one for us? You're going to be sad that you didn't read more when you move on next semester. Darn it. Just kidding. I'll read it. Actually, to redeem those who lived in the past and to re recreate all it was. If it were thus I willed it, that alone should I call redemption. Will, that is the name of the liberator and joy bringer. Thus I taught you, my friends. But now learn this too. The will itself is still a prisoner. Willing liberates. But what is it that puts even the liberator uh, himself in fetters? It was. That is the name of the will gnashing of teeth in the most secret melancholy. Powerless against what has been done, he is an angry spectator of all that is past. The will cannot will backwards, and that he cannot break time and time's covetousness. That is the will's loneliest melancholy. Good. What do you think it means? I don't know. I was reading it. Yeah, no, no. I do the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's what that Ashley, you want to read the second paragraph? Yeah. Um, before I do, uh, I was wondering if it's like, is what he, he means by this all like that we need to we should function like we go a little machine and like that it's not just that our ears are so big it's that the rest of us like we're not you know working on those muscles um yeah so I, th I think that's a side product of what's going on here that's sort of like if if you um heed the warning that uh Nietzsche's presenting us here then that'll be sort of what comes as you you become the well oiled machine all right, sorry, sorry to break it up. Okay, willing liberty, uh, willing liberates. What means does the will devise for himself to get rid of his melancholy and to mock his dungeon? Alas, every prisoner becomes a fool, and the imprisoned will regains himself foolishly. That time does not run backwards. That is his wrath. That which was is the name of the stone he cannot move. And so he moves stones out of wrath and displeasure, and he wreaks revenge on whatever does not feel wrath and displeasure as he does. Thus wreaks revenge, I don't know, thus the will, the liberator, took, the, took to hurrying, and on all who can suffer, he wreaks revenge for his inability to go backwards. This, indeed, this alone is what revenge is. The will's ill will against time and it was good. All right, who wants to tell us what it means? Who wants to give it a shot? Jay. I'll just ask this in question quote because I read it like twice last time and still don't get it. But is it is he talking about a longing for the past? It seems more deep than that, but that's kind of the idea that I got. Yeah, the it was right. And the will can liberate itself, but the will focuses on this past. The it was. But is he talking about in the individual? Like if back when I was seven years old and everything was happy, or is he talking about the time 200 years ago when everybody was happy? I think maybe both. Um, you know, wouldn't it have been better if I had been born with a trust fund because then I wouldn't have to work? Or wouldn't it be better if uh, everybody had been born with a trust fund, right? Um, wouldn't it have been better if uh, you know, we didn't have a World War II Holocaust or World War II at all, right? Um, the it was plagues the past. And the will 
can liberate itself, but focuses on the past. Yeah. Um, I think it's, I think there's some sort of like life happened to me versus I made this decision. And I think that's sort of the distinction that he's making. That if you put yourself at the butt end of life and say, this happened to me and then this happened to me and then this happened to me, I guess he's saying there's kind of no hope for you to have your will liberated and to sort of um, put yourself in the position of this ubermensch. Yeah. Yeah, you become like a, it was a Willie Loman or the, the old guy in Glengarry Glen Ross, the life happening, exactly. And the will can always act in the present and I always seek the future. But when it looks at, oh, this just happened to me, it can't change that. It's a stone that it can't move, right? Um, and so the will hurts itself. It traps itself. It feels um, pain at the only thing that it wants to be liberated from to change is what it can't. And so it lashes out in wrath and displeasure. Good. What else? What, what else do we see in this? What do we think of the last line? What revenge is? I, I uh, agree a lot with what she said, sorry. Tyler, Tyler said. Um, but I feel like, and I, I wonder as well, like it doesn't adjust the time piece as well. So I guess I'm taking a stab at that, which would be like, uh, you're almost angry that time moves forward, like flows like a river, like in one direction, and you can never change that. And maybe it comes back to his like, everything's uh, in constant flux too. There is no um, way to step out of the river. There's no sand that does not change. Um, and so maybe this is like, when life is just happening to you, you're frustrated because uh, there's no grasp. There's nothing to hold on to. Yeah. So you're just kind of like drowning in the river. But why lash out? Why does the will hurt itself? To Jason and Tyler and then Ashley? I guess it's like that feeling of weakness, like you're not the one in control. I also think the first line is really important because I think he also thinks that this will is the way out as well. Mm -hmm. and there's a, this risk that you fall into this trap of being resentful, but if you can avoid that trap, you can turn all the it was into a I willed it. So good. If you can pull that off, you could, but yeah, but it's natural for us to slip into the alternative. Good, Tyler? Um, I think it's probably just uh, like probably like the same reason why a prisoner would like bang on the walls of his cell, like just to express that anger or that hurt as anger instead of as like a hopelessness. Yeah, and he mentions the, the prisoner just after this um, quote. I don't know if I have it. Written in. No, I don't. I'll find it. But yeah, exactly. That the the prisoner bangs their hands against the wall and makes their knuckles bleed, and so redeems themselves poorly is what Nietzsche says in, in the, the quote that I'm thinking of. Right. That um, the will that lashes out wishes that it hadn't have committed the crime that led it there. And remember at the beginning of class, I said that um, themes of Nietzsche exist in all of the other existentialists. Marceau's being in the jail cell is meant to represent a prisoner who doesn't will himself uh, poorly, harshly, who doesn't um, uh, lash out in wrath and revenge and resent them all ultimately um, by accepting the priest's uh, consolement, but rather uh, opens himself up to the cool indifference of the world, which is quite the opposite of this sort of heated passion and pain that, um, the will turned backwards to the it was um, uh, creates that that feeling. Good. Ashley. Um, from a perspective of physics, um, time and space are not the same dimension. They are completely set, like no. I'm sorry, I'm being I'm being yeah, I'm going too far into what I'm trying to say. Um, but like the past 
was um, what it was, but like it, the, it's not true anymore. Like the truth only exists in th this current space and this current time. And so um, to live in the past, you are actually physically like imprisoning yourself because um, you're thinking about what happened and there's no way to change what you did um, in response then. Um, and so there's no way you can do that now. Um, and I don't know where I was going with this, but basically like, do you see where I'm going? Yeah, th just, this is it, good. I think it's illogical is what I'm saying. Yeah, so it's, it's illogical to do what you cannot do, but the will wishes that it could, and so it hurts itself. Right, because it, it it knows that it can do anything except that, right? And the the idea of of its ability to access the present, um, we'll see in the next quote that we read, which is the the gateway. Um, the gateway is named moment, right? The present, um, and it's in the present through the present that um, the will can liberate itself. And in liberating itself at the gateway moment or present, um, it reaches infinitely forward and backwards and redeems that it was and it has been and it will be cool uh to be back before you said that text kind of seems like a loop to me like uh becoming a prison link uh, or every prisoner becomes a fool and in prison will deem himself as a fool and it keeps like going off of you as well cause and effect keeps going with the whole narrative and then goes back to what he originally did and it's like a loop of the imprisonment essentially good yeah, so you're right about the loop too, that we're all caught in this loop. Um, and we can live in the loop resentfully, wrathfully, with vengeance in our hearts and hatred and full of nihilism, right? Um, or we have the alternative, which um, is redemption through transfiguration and the eternal return. So um, this one I want somebody to read the whole thing from the book. So I have like the most important thing here, um, but who wants to read The Greatest Weight, which gives us our first formula, Jason, the first formulation of the eternal return. It's 341, it's just three paragraphs. What if some day or night a demon were to steal after you into your loneliest loneliness and say to you, this life as you now live it and have lived it, you will have to live once more and innumerable times more. And there will be nothing new in it, but every pain and every joy and every thought and sigh and everything unutterably small or great in your life will have to return to you all in the same succession and sequence. Even this spider and this moonlight between the trees and even this moment and I myself. The eternal hourglass of existence is turned upside down again and again, and you with it, speck of dust. Would you not throw yourself down and gnash your teeth and curse the demon who spoke thus? Or have you experienced a tremendous moment when you would have, when you would have answered him, you are a god and never have I heard anything more divine? If this thought gained possession of you, it would change you as you are or perhaps crush you. The question in each and everything, do you desire this once more? and innumerable times more would lie upon your actions as the greatest weight? Or how well disposed would you have to be, would you have to become to yourself and to life to crave nothing more fervently than this ultimate eternal confirmation and seal? Thanks. All right, do you wanna tell us what it means? Your shape? I think it's, like his goal is you can reach this point where yeah, it's just all worth it. You don't regret anything and you've come to get so much out of life that even those really painful experiences are worth it. And maybe you even get some value out of the painful experiences too. Like it's all worth doing. Yeah, this is the result of uh, transfiguration and redemption. Good. What else do we see in this? There's more themes to pull out. Why is it a, the greatest weight? Why is it a demon that speaks to us in our loneliest loneliness? Right? Why do we respond with gnashing of teeth? 
but it results in this. And it's like justification of everything. So hopefully. Is anyone, am I okay to oh, respond? Yeah, uh, we'll get Jason and then I, I'll get you, Mikey. I think it's another example of the will turning back on itself and feeling you're feeling in that position of weakness. You're remembering those painful experiences and you don't want to just let them be. You want to lash, lash out. Yeah. Yeah. But still there is a way in looking backwards to not gnash your teeth, but to find the transfiguration. Good. Mikey. I think this is a really interesting response if you look at it as an alternative response to nihilism. You know, there's the, um, well, I mean, it's classic to us, but I don't know if this, this fits with the timeline of Nietzsche, but the, you know, live every day like it's your last because like it's the only one you have. But if you flip it and you're like, live every day like you're going to have to live it again, you know, suddenly you have meaning and purpose in your life again. Um, that's just like, a, I think a really good direct response to uh, like nihilism and like the demon and the gnashing of teeth, like that's all, you know, the demon is nihilism, like the impending um, existential threat, I guess, to meaningless, like the meaninglessness um, and like the gnashing of teeth is like the natural response. Um, and I, I just really like seeing this as an alternative um, I don't know if it was intended that way, though. Yeah, I, I love this take that the the eternal recurrence being spoken by the demon is an expression of what would inspire nihilism in us, what would inspire uh, us to gnash our teeth and fight it, right? To say, no, I refuse. I will not accept that the world returns and recurs over and over again. Um, but how best to overcome the seeming meaninglessness of everything if it all just occurs over and over again and we have no will or power in it how best to overcome that but to will just that thing itself the recurrence of everything the return of it all the ability to live it over and over again and have it um, be something that we will so greatly so powerfully that we, be, we become disposed to crave nothing more than this life which returns and recurs over and over. This is the ultimate confirmation and seal, right? Says Nietzsche. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was just thinking when I read this the first time, I, um, you know, like I read the part where like, oh, well, I like I would totally gnash my teeth, you know, I'm gonna be like, if I was totally have to live again, I'm like, come on, it's unfair, or whatever, you know. <laughs> um, but then, you know, he follows it up with like, uh, like you could also see it. And I don't know what Nietzsche thinks of this, but you know, he follows it up. I think like you could also see it as a sort of like a divine experience, you know, where you're like, oh, this is a divine thing that's happening to be able to live again. And so I don't know, it's like you can like either way it works, you know, and you, you there's no like right way again, you know, but um, but it's kind of just cultivating your own path and choosing it, but at the same time, you know, also not being myopic or and using, you know, choosing the right ashes to to kind of back up what you're doing. I yeah, good. Um, you can go either way, but there's a way that is so much more powerful and like life affirming and makes it all feel good. Um, and then there's a way that is um, that is easy, but we're lying to ourselves and causes the national teeth. Good. Oh. Um, I think it just kind of focuses you on like the whole of existence as opposed to something within existence like the whole truth of like your life and the fact that you're here as opposed to other things that might that might distract you from that fact yeah so it requires a different kind of perspective you can't just have the in order to will this eternal turn in order to fight the gnashing of teeth um and so fervently crave nothing more than the return um you have to have a perspective that sees all of it right, that zooms out, because um, your, your small individual perspective um, isn't enough to give you what you need to affirm so eternally. But it's from your small individual perspective that you create the value that allows you to zoom out and um, see holistically the world that in, in the way that um, enables you to, to will it eternally. Now, 
Here's a question, because this is a debate in the literature on Nietzsche, is how we should understand the idea of eternal recurrence. So is what Nietzsche saying, uh, we need to will the actual like physical return of the world, right? We need to believe so fervently and powerfully that it does all happen again, that it's all gonna loop and recycle itself. And everything that has happened will happen in the same way over and over again. That it's a metaphysical thesis, the eternal return. The world does this and we must will it and find a value that enables us to will that. Um, or is it a metaphorical thesis? Is the eternal return supposed to stand for something? Like the perspective that we take, is it actually on this world and this life? Or is it a quality of the perspective that treats the world as if, right? And it's by treating the world as if that we can derive the sort of value that makes it all re redeemable. Yeah. Um, I think that you could bring in Kierkegaard here with his like belief versus faith thing, you know, like that's the, that's what makes the difference. Maybe he's saying like to think of it in the metaphysical way because then it will like make you actually think even though he doesn't really think it, you know what I mean? Yeah, and this is an argument given um, by Nietzsche scholars where they, they say, look, um, even if Nietzsche didn't like really think materially, metaphysically that the world returned or recurred, um, the willing, the act of willing itself requires that. And it's just sort of a feature of the step, um, maybe a kind of leap of faith that um, enables that the eternal life affirmation. Good. Does anybody else have interest, Jason, have an intuition about this? Uh, yeah, I'd say given his flair for style, I'm inclined to interpret it metaphorically. Metaphorically, okay. Um, and especially because in this passage, passage, at least, it begins with a what if. So he's kind of presenting it as a, I don't know, it's, it's easy for me to interpret it as kind of a little story. Yeah, what if someday, what, like, just think about it, right? Imagine it. Now, the, the eternal recurrence shows up over and over, and we'll look at another um, pass at it that we read from Zarathustra. Um, yeah, I, I like that the, the language is metaphorical, and so we might think that the recurrence itself is supposed to be willed as a metaphor. It's a, it's a cool literary point. Um, yeah, Rachel. Um, I, I'm more inclined to think it's metaphorical and having to do with kind of the nature of suffering. Um, I might butcher this, but I like, I remember reading a quote about Nietzsche speaking about alcohol and that like he advocates against the consumption of alcohol because all it does is prolong your suffering and has like a compounding effect almost. And so like the, the eternal recurrence makes me think that like when you live in that present moment and are just like receiving all that is instead of you know living too much in the past or living too much in the future, having that, I, I don't like the word cripple, but that the like, inverse cripple um, then you can become more like synthetic in your existence and not necessarily do away with suffering, but prevent that loop where it like maybe increases suffering more because you're in a state of avoidance or in a state of my, like being a dogmatist or myopic or whatever. I don't know if that's coherent, but yeah, that's what I got. Yeah, so the, the perspective um, on temporality is an important one. So like the eternal recurrence, right? It's, it's over and over, it includes both uh, past and future. Um, but we only exist in the present moment is a bit of a riddle. Um, and it's supposed to serve something of the function, at least as I take it, that, that you're um, eliminating here, Rachel, which is that like this, this helps redeem us of um, the nihilism. It helps redeem us of the, the suffering of the world of the past and the suffering that might come of the future because it's all worth it in this perspective that is able to say yes to life over and over and over again. Um, but how we make sense of that temporal puzzle um, is unclear, but a really interesting one to um, try to adjudicate, which we will in the next slide. Yeah. Yeah, I think I have like a pretty similar take to Rachel. I kind of took it that he's trying to essentially say, trying to like, remove the question of the future and the past and like what if and how this like all like teach us like be so in the moment that time doesn't matter and when time doesn't matter 
like eternalize yourself. I don't know how else to describe it, but it's like the like the idea that if you don't realize time in the sense that you're thinking about what could be or what has been, you're just living so with everything that you don't like acknowledge what could be. I don't know how to explain it. Like that makes sense. So. Yeah. So you're you're touching on um, the challenge of uh, what it would be to um, will an eternal recurrence that looks both backwards and forwards, but we only exist in the present. It's, it's really challenging. So why don't we look at an example of it? Uh, I love this. Stop dwarf, as you or I, but I am the stronger of us too. You do not know my abysmal thought. This is from Zarathustra now, but you got to know like the abysmal thought is certainly the greatest way, right? It's what the the demon whispers to Zarathustra in his loneliness, loneliness that you could not bear. Behold this gateway dwarf. It has two faces. Two paths meet here. No one has yet followed either to its end. This long lane stretches back for an eternity and the long lane out there that is another eternity. They contradict each other. These paths, they offend each other face to face. And it is here at this gateway that they come together. The name of the gateway is inscribed above moment, but whoever would follow one of them on and on farther and farther. Do you believe dwarf that these paths contradict each other eternally? All that is straight lies, the dwarf murmured contemptuously. All truth is crooked. Time itself is a circle. So has anybody seen True Detective? Yeah, so time is a flat circle, says Matthew McConaughey. Um, this is where that comes from. All right, so what's happening here? There's a second part, but um, let's take it piece by piece, chunk by chunk. So, okay, just to give you the story, um, Zarathustra is climbing a mountain and there's a dwarf on his back, which is like weighing him down, right? Um, and, uh, and finally, Zarathustra, um, strikes up the courage in himself to yank the dwarf off his back and, and like confront it. Like you've been weighing me down, I've been carrying you this whole way. Um, and, and the the dwarf is meant to represent something of like a, a, a monstrosity and an external um, like, like backpack of evil that is on him um, that he carries around right everywhere. Um, and he's finally saying, look, stop, it's you or I. Um, and I'm the stronger of us too. And so let me face you. And, and so takes this, this dwarf off of him and tells him this, right? Listen to my thought. And the dwarf responds, the time is at circle. So what, what's going on here? Jason. Uh, I think Zarathustra is open to willing the eternal return and wants to keep walking on the path. And the dwarf, when he says all that is straight lies, it's like Ivan saying, he. Even if he saw two parallel lines cross, he wouldn't believe it. The dwarf is not willing to accept this possibility of the eternal return. Yeah, good, right? Um, the dwarf is Ivan or Kierkegaard's knight of uh, infinite, or not knight, uh, person of infinite resignation, right? The person who takes that step, but doesn't take the next one. And for Kierkegaard, it's the leap of faith, right? Um, for Ivan, it's returning the ticket, whatever that's supposed to mean. Uh, for Zarathustra, here, it seems to be something else, something to do with this temporal strangeness of willing and eternal recurrence, this thought, this abysmal thought that the dwarf could not bear, right? Good, so what the dwarf is saying in time itself is a circle, time is a flat circle, is, um, I agree with you, Jason, is just this, um, that one is resigned to the world as it is, and it's all interconnected and determined and what it will be, um, and if the world is what it will be, then there's nothing to add to it, to make it, to justify it, to redeem it, to transfigure it, to make it better. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, the whole thing is just kind of the, the will trying to get rid of, or it's just imprisoning it's, itself, right? Like, I think the dwarf's kind of just saying, like, you can't get rid of me, you know, like, you can't have to deal with it and, and kind of just own up to it. Yeah. So, so here we have two paths going infinitely in both directions, presumably the past and the future, right? And the gateway where I've set you down, dwarf, is, is moment, is the present. Um, 
And the dwarf says, yeah, what are you going to do about it? Right. So you've set, set up the field. Now what? Does anybody want to read this one? Anybody who hasn't read? I can do Rachel. it. Thanks, Rachel. OK. Is it from Behold? Yeah, Behold. OK. Behold, I continue this moment. From this gateway moment, a long eternal lane leads backward. Behind us lies an eternity. Must not whatever can walk have walked on this lane before? Must not whatever can happen have happened, have been done, have passed by before? And if any everything has been done there before, what do you think this of this what do you think worth of this moment? Must not this gateway too have been there before? And are not all things knotted together so firmly that this moment draws after it all that is to come? Therefore, itself too? For whatever can walk in this long lane out there too, it must walk once more. And Zarathustra looks around and the dwarf has disappeared. So he's banished his dwarf. Anybody want to take a shot? What Zarathustra just told us? Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. So what exactly is the difference between an eternal return and a circle though? This is a good question. Um, Cause it seems that, well, it seems like they're contradictory. Like uh, his idea is the eternal return, the circle. And this is an, like, con uh, like an opposing idea of the contradictory past. But then he talks about like things having happened, they'll happen again. So this moment will have already happened and happen again. And I don't see a huge difference in them other than the fact that like it seems like the circle is repetitive but always the same and then this is like the same moments but I don't know if that still contains like the sameness I guess I'm just a little confused as to like what what concepts like Nietzsche is touching on like Zarathustra is talking about versus like what the dwarf is saying like is there a difference in this repetitive time concept yeah like, so, so i'm not sure what it is speaking. um yeah so, so like the way that zarathustra presents the gateway is like present moment and then past future extend infinitely both like a single line in contradiction because they're going in opposite directions and the door says no time as a circle seems to like loop together right um, does anybody want to interpret this, Dylan? Well, I've taken it two different ways. The first one is that life, you're born, you travel through life and come back and you die. So it's a circle. And the second one is that you get up in the morning and you go along the path and you go to bed and then morning you get back up and go along the path. And so it's a smaller circle. So I the dwarf's not necessarily wrong. Yeah, good. Okay, so Ashley, follow up. And the in, even bigger circle is, um, I read The Absurd by Nagel this week on accident. And- um, <laughs> Congratulations, a good paper. Good paper. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I really like what you said there, which is like, he's like, everyone talks about how nothing, um, it, nothing you do now will, um, matter in a hundred years, but at the same time, nothing or whatever, you know, like it works both ways. Well, people only think about it one way and like, um, yeah. So, so I'm like really bad at explaining, <laughs> but like, um, like the just humanity as a whole is gonna, it, it, it like came into existence and it's gonna be gone from existence and a lot of people look at that with sorrow but um he thinks that it's like inspiring yeah and the the inspiring perspective is not the one that loops back on itself so here's what i make of the zarathustra verse dwarf the lines versus circles and who knows but i think we're onto something here right which is that either eternally right like you have a whole life you're born you 
die, you're born, you die, you're born, you die. Or the rat race day by day, we go to work, we wake up, we go to sleep, our alarm goes off at the same time every morning, right? Um, that seeing that kind of life as full and complete is to see time as a circle, that it just repeats itself over and over. And this is a terrible thought, a great weight which is what the dwarf represents, weighing down Zarathustra as Zarathustra tries to climb the mountain. Um, but Zarathustra cuts the circle in half, right? And the lines spring out. And what we see is not a completeness, the rat race repeating itself over and over, but we see an infinity going forward and an infinity going backwards. And it's from this sort of um, eternal perspective um, rather than the minute one, the, the finite one that sees it all is already complete, but as um, to be completed always, uh, that uh, the weight becomes something light and easy, um, that it becomes something uh, bearable that might lift us up and forward. Now, why it does that, I don't really know, but I think that's what's going on with the line circle thing. But Mikey, what, what do you think now that we've talked a little bit about it? I mean, it makes a lot more sense now that we've talked about it because all I could think of is like, they're both infinite. Like what could possibly really be the difference? But like the fact that a circle circle is um, like self-enclosed, like you can never escape. Um, like a circle is almost a trap, an infinite trap. Whereas like a continuous um, line, like, and I, I think at first I also thought he was talking like metaphysically about time. And I was like, are we having a Heidegger moment? <laughs> um, but I'm realizing now it's, it seems to be much more about like, either way time is infinite and you can either like stay in the moment and always have the past before and after you, um, like available to you to walk or you can be trapped uh, kind of in a circular infiniteness um, where you, you don't have a choice where you walk. At yeah. least that was my. And are not all things it. knotted together so firmly that this moment draws after it all that is to come, therefore itself too. So the, the gateway is sort of this magnetic power that draws the eternities backwards and forwards into it and will continue to, to be that magnetic force. So I think there's a difference in perspective too, which is the, the rat race kind of perspective, the looping of life on itself. Um, and it, it sort of loses value and it's already being sort of performed without us, right? Um, just as Marceau's trial is performed without his participation at all. There's the absurd, right? Um, that the rat race perspective sees life as happening without us, but this moment perspective sees us only existing in this moment, but this recognizing the moment as extending both forward and backwards eternally, um, that kind of perspective is something very different. And that kind of perspective is the one that's able to extend its value outwards completely and make life redeemable and to say yes to it. I also just realized that a gateway almost implies like autonomy, like a gateway is something that you choose. Um, where it's like a circle, like there's a lack of autonomy. Good. Yeah, so I, I think this is all, all just about there. Um, okay, so we did that one. Okay, so right, this is this will be our last thing that we do for, for today. Um, and this is extra, super, double, triple weird. Um, but I think it's really cool. It is the vision that Zarathustra has just after Zarathustra has banished his dwarf. Um, and it is enigmatic and strange and really cool. It's an image that I want to see what you all think about it. Because at least with respect to the narrative, Zarathustra has this, you know, sort of um, longish diatribe against the dwarf where he reveals his abysmal thought and we get the whole like sort of conceptual expression of what's going on. It, it's still, you know, very symbolic. Um, but then we get like something like a fable parable. Um, does anybody want to read this one? I could read it. Sure. Among wild cliffs, I stood suddenly alone, bleak in the bleakest moonlight. The 
there lie a man, and there the dog, jumping, bristling, whining. Now he saw me coming, and he howled again. He cried, had I ever heard, have I ever heard a dog cry like this for help? And verily what I saw, I had never seen the like. A young shepherd I saw, riding, gagging in spasms, his face distorted, and a heavy black snake hung out of his mouth. Had I ever seen so much nausea and pale dread on one face? He seemed to have been asleep when the snake crawled into his throat and there bit itself fast. My hand tore at the snake and tore in vain. It did not tear the snake out of his throat. Then it cried out of me, bite, bite its head off, bite. Thus, thus it cried out of me, my dread, my hatred, my nausea, my pity. All that is good and wicked in me cried out with me, cried out of me with a single cry. Kind of cool. So Zarathustra hears this dog crying for help. Like, Lassie, is little Jimmy falling down the well? But no, it turns out to be a shepherd who fell asleep and a black snake slithered into his mouth and bit fast his throat. And Zarathustra um, feels himself trying to tear the snake away. And he can't, the snake is bit fast. And so all of his nausea, his pity, his hatred and his dread fly out and say, bite it off, bite off the head of the snake. And this is the vision, right? Um, so the, the chapter is the vision and the riddle. Uh, but what does it mean? In the context of what we just talked about, how do we interpret this story? Jason. I think one part of it, the snake is something similar to the dwarf and that it prevents you or it tries to prevent you from saying yes to life or affirming the eternal return. That's the source of the dread and nausea. So the biting it off is what is necessary to finally do those things part of it maybe. good yeah biting off the head of the snake is what um enables us to engage in the eternal return. i think that's right not sure what the biting actually is yeah just sure. to add to what you said that he couldn't help him he couldn't yank the snake out of the guy's mouth the guy had to do it himself Again. Yeah, so Zarathustra represents a Jesus figure. I mean, like every chapter ends with thus spake Zarathustra, right? That um, the book is meant to mirror the Bible in um, literary power and in its, its narrative as well. And Zarathustra is something of a shepherd of men, right? And supposed to like help people uh, like Christ did, but he can't help this person. And it's in the release of his dread and hatred and nausea and pity his release of all of these emotions that um, uh, represent themselves as bite the head off, um, do it yourself. You, I can't help you. Yeah. Other interpretations? Ashley. Maybe the, like the dog and the shepherd are like the past versions of him and he's like, trying to access them kind of like I was saying before to help him out but he can't he can only like act in the act like in the present yeah maybe we're having a bit of like identity synecdoche right where the the, the self separates and um Zarathustra is calling crying to himself um help me help me but um he must only be able to help himself that's kind of a cool take I like that one yeah I see it as like, well, I don't know. I struggle with like, with some Nietzsche of just like how he like claims that everyone should have like their own perspective and kind of just pursue their own path, right? And, but like with this example, I think it's, um, it's tricky because I think he's kind of confronting, um, you know, like something besides himself. You know, he's confronting like other, others outside of himself. And he has, to, you know, he wants to help, but he can. And I think a lot of it before, what Zarathustra was, was facing was kind of just this internal, um, these problems like the dwarf on his back and whatever. Um, but now he's kind of facing, um, you know, a, a, a third party who's kind of complicating things. 
and he doesn't know what to do, but he knows what he wants. Yeah, okay, so so he solved the problem for himself sort of with banishing the dwarf and he sees a mirror rep a parallel representation of what he was just experiencing dwarf on the back snake biting down your throat it's a little more violent but um we can interpret this as like a parallel to zarathustra and zarathustra what zarathustra has done for himself he cannot do for someone else right this comes back to shane's comment um the shepherd has to perform the act himself um, so I'll say this much as well, like we didn't read the transformations of man. So it's similar to Kierkegaard, Nietzsche has ideas of like the progression of being where we start as a camel and we carry the world with us, right? Where like we're taught just like what the world is and who's popular and who should, we should believe and what we should believe. And so we like are a camel, we're a beast of burden. Um, but then there are lions among us in the world who are like get rid of that and they like fight the world and they have the courage to take it on and to like create those dogmas and, and uh, beliefs themselves to to lash out and, and um, you know, be passionate individuals. And then they're the children, right? So the, the camel becomes the lion, becomes the child uh, and transfigures itself by releasing things like uh, hatred and nausea and pity to give up these feelings. Um, and it's the child who experiences the world with sort of the, the renewed innocence that um, uh, is the highest form of being uh, for Nietzsche, which this happens at the end of Zarathustra. Um, and so we might be seeing uh, Zarathustra himself undergoing in this vision of the shepherd and the snake, the becoming uh, of the child and the renewal of his own innocence. Uh, but that is for a class on Nietzsche, if you take a class on Nietzsche. So we're done. That's it for this week. I'm going to stop here. Um, we will. We have our reading group today. So if you read the Simone Bay, uh, stick around. We'll get started in, we'll probably give it like 10 minutes. Um, next week is movie week. So if you're going to come in person to watch the screening of the movie here, please be here before five, because I'm going to start it like right at five. And uh, so like you know, 4.45, if you're able, it's okay if you come late, but do your best to come early if you're gonna come so that we have time for everything. If you're online, 6.45 for the discussion. Um, and if you're in the future, I'll release the discussion on Canvas through the cloud recordings, but I won't put it on YouTube. Um, so see y'all next week. <laughs>